morning everyone and today we begin our studies early we continue our reading of book four or Liber Abba um, and this is part one chapter seven Samadhi and we are looking at the eight limbs of yoga as interpreted in this book chapter seven Samadhi more rubbish has been written about Samadhi than enough. We must endeavor to avoid adding to the heap. Even Patanjali, who is extraordinarily clear and practical in most things, begins to rave when he talks of it. Even if what he said were true, he should not have mentioned it, because it does not sound true, and we should make no statement that is a priori improbable without being prepared to back it up with the fullest proofs but it is more than likely that his commentators have misunderstood him. The most reasonable statement of any acknowledged authority is that of Yajnavalkya, who says, quote, By pranayama, impurities of the body are thrown out. By dharana, the impurities of the mind. By pratyahara, impurities of attachment and by samadhi is taken off everything that hides the lordship of the soul." Unquote. There is a modest statement in good literary form, if we can only do as well as that. In the first place, what is the meaning of the term? Etymologically, sam is the Greek sam, the English prefix sin, meaning together with, adhi means lord, and a reasonable translation of the whole word would be union with God, the exact term used by Christian mystics to describe their attainment. Now there is great confusion because the Buddhists use the word samadhi to mean something entirely different, the mere faculty of attention. Thus with them to think of a cat is to make samadhi on that cat. They use the word jhana to describe mystic states. This is excessively misleading, for as we saw in the last section, dhyana is a preliminary of samadhi, and of course jhana is merely the wretched plebeian poly corruption of it. Um, the footnote says, The vulgarism and provincialism of the Buddhist canon is infinitely repulsive to all nice minds, and the attempt to use the terms of an egocentric philosophy to explain the details of a psychology whose principal doctrine is the denial of the ego, was the work of a mischievous idiot. Let us unhesitatingly reject these abominations, these nastinesses of the beggars dressed in rags that they have snatched from corpses, and follow the etymological significance of the word as given above. That's the end of the footnote. There are many kinds of samadhi. The footnote says, apparently, that is, the obvious results are different. Possibly the cause is only one, refracted through diverse media. That's the end of the footnote. So there are, very, there are many kinds of samadhi. Some authors consider Atma Darshana, the universe, as a single phenomenon without conditions, to be the first real samadhi. If we accept this, we must relegate many less exalted states to the class of dhyana. Patanjali enumerates a number of these states. To perform these on different things gives different magical powers, or so he says. These need not be debated here. Anyone who wants magic powers can get them in dozens of different ways. Power grows faster than desire. The boy who wants money to buy lead soldiers sets to work to obtain it, and by the time he has got it wants something else instead, in all probability something just beyond his means. Such is the splendid history of all spiritual advance. One never stops to take the reward. We shall, therefore, not trouble at all about what any samadhi may or may not bring as far as its results in our lives are concerned. We began this book, it will be remembered, with considerations of death. Death has now lost all meaning. The idea of death depends on those of the ego and of time. These ideas have been destroyed, and so, quote, death is swallowed up in victory, unquote. 
We shall now only be interested in what Samadhi is in itself and in the conditions which cause it. Let us try a final definition. Dhyana resembles Samadhi in many respects. There is a union of the ego and the non-ego, and a loss of the sense of time and space, space and causality. Duality in any form is abolished. The idea of time involves that of two consecutive things, that of space, two non-coincident things, that of causality, two connected things. These dhyanic conditions contradict those of normal thought, but in samadhi they are very much more marked than in dhyana. And while in the latter it seems like a simple union of two things, in the former it appears as if all things rush together and united. One might say that in dhyana there was still this quality latent, that the one existing was opposed to the many non-existing. In samadhi the many and the one are united in a union of existence with non-existence. This definition is not made from reflection but from memory. Further, it is easy to master the trick or knack of dhyana. After a while, one can get into that state without preliminary practice, and looking at it from this point, one seems able to reconcile the two meanings of the word, which we debated in the last section. From below, dhyana seems like a trance, an experience so tremendous that one cannot think of anything bigger while from above it seems merely a state of mind as natural as any other. Frater P., before he had Samadhi, wrote of Dhyana, quote, Perhaps as a result of the intense control, a nervous storm breaks. This we call Dhyana. Dot, dot, dot. Samadhi is but an expansion of this, so far as I can see, unquote. Five years later, he would not take this view. He would say perhaps that dhyana was, quote, a flowing of the mind and one unbroken current from the ego to the non-ego without consciousness of either, accompanied by a crescent wonder and bliss, unquote. He can understand how that is the natural result of dhyana, but he cannot call dhyana in the same way the precursor of samadhi. Perhaps he does not really know the conditions which induce samadhi, he can produce dhyana at will in the course of a few minutes' work, and it often happens with apparent spontaneity. With samadhi, this, this is unfortunately not the case. He probably can get it at will, but could not say exactly how, or tell how long it might take him, and he could not be sure of getting it at all. One feels sure that one can walk a mile along a level road, one knows the conditions, and it would have to be a very extraordinary set of circumstances that would stop one. But though it would be equally fair to say, quote, I have climbed the Matterhorn, and I know I can climb it again, unquote. Yet there are all sorts of more or less probable circumstances, any one of which would prevent success. Now we do know this, that if thought is kept single and steady, dhyana results. We do not know whether an intensification of this is sufficient to cause samadhi, or whether some other circumstances are required. One is science, the other empiricism. One author says, unless memory deceives, that twelve seconds steadiness is dharana, a hundred and forty-four dhyana, and seventeen hundred and twenty-eight samadhi, and vivekananda, commenting on patanjali makes dhyana a, a mere prolongation of dharana but says further quote, suppose i were meditating on a book and i gradually succeeded in concentrating the mind on it and perceiving only the internal sensations the meaning unexpressed in any form that state of dhyana is called samadhi unquote. Other authors are inclined to suggest that samadhi results from meditating on subjects that are in themselves worthy. For example, Vivekananda says, quote, Think of any holy subject, unquote, and explains this as follows, quote, This does not mean any wicked subject. Unquote. Frater P. would not like to say definitely whether he got, ever got dhyana from common objects, he gave up the practice after a few months and meditated on the chakras, etc. Also, his dhyana became so common that he gave up recording it. 
but if he wished to do it this minute he would choose something to excite his godly fear or holy awe or wonderment there is no apparent reason why diana should not occur when thinking of any common object of the seashore such as the blue pig but frater p's constant reference to this as the usual object of his meditation need not be taken au pied de la lettre his records of meditation contain no reference to this remarkable animal okay to the foot of the letter literally french okay it will be a good thing when organized research has determined the conditions of samadhi but in the meantime there seems no particular objection to our following tradition and using the same objects of meditation as our predecessors with the single exception which we shall note in due course the first class of objects for serious meditation as opposed to preliminary practice in which one should keep to simple recognizable objects whose definiteness is easy to maintain is various parts of the body the hindus have an elaborate system of anatomy and physiology which is apparently no reference to the facts of the dissecting room prominent in this class are the seven chakras which will be described in part two there uh, there are also various nerves equally mythical the second class is objects of devotion such as the idea or form of the deity or the heart or body of your teacher or of some man whom you respect profoundly this practice is not to be commended because it implies a bias of the mind you can also meditate on your dreams this sounds superstitious but the idea is that you have already a tendency independent of your conscious will to think of those things which will consequently be easier to think of than others that this is the explanation is evident from the nature of the preceding and subsequent classes you can also meditate on anything that especially appeals to you but in all this one feels inclined to suggest that it will be better and more convincing if the meditation is directed to an object which in itself is apparently unimportant one does not want the mind to be excited in any way even by adoration see the three meditative methods of lieber h h h at the same time one would not like to deny positively that it is very much easier to take some idea towards which the mind would naturally flow the hindus assert that the nature of the object determines the samadhi that is the nature of those lower samadhis which confer so-called magical powers for example there are the yoga prat vriti meditating on the tip of the nose one obtains what one may be called the ideal smell that is a smell which is not any particular smell but is the archetypal smell of which all actual smells are modifications it is the smell which is not a smell this is the only reasonable description for the experience being contrary to reason it is only reasonable that the words describing it should be contrary to reason too the footnote hence the athanasian creed compare the precise parallel in the zohar the head of all heads the head which is not a head into the footnote similarly concentration on the tip of the tongue gives the ideal taste on the dorsum of the tongue ideal contact every atom of the body comes into contact with every atom in the universe all at once is the description of bhikkhu ananda metea gives of it the root of the tongue gives the ideal sound and the pharnix the ideal sight long footnote here similarly patanjali tells us this is the footnote i'm reading now similarly patanjali tells us that by making samyama on the strength of an elephant or a tiger the student acquires that strength conquer the nerve udana and you can walk on the water samana and you begin to flash with light the elements fire air earth and water and you can do whatever in natural life they prevent you from doing for instance by conquering earth one could take a short cut to australia or by conquering water one can live at the bottom of the ganges they say there is a holy man at benares who does this 
coming up only once a year to comfort and instruct his disciples. But nobody need believe this unless he wants to, and you are even advised to conquer that desire should it arise. It will be interesting when science really determines the variables and, and constants of these equations. End of the footnote. Similarly, concentration... Oh, wait. Okay. Okay. The Samadhi par excellence, however, is Atma Darshana, which for some, and those not the least instructed, is the first real Samadhi, for even the visions of God and of the Self, capital S, are tainted by form. In Atma Darshana, the All is manifested as the One. It is the universe freed from its conditions. Not only are all forms and ideas destroyed, but also those conceptions which are implicit in our ideas of those ideas. The footnote says this is so complete that not only black is white, but the whiteness of black is the essential of the, its blackness. Not equals one equals infinity, but this is only true because of this threefold arrangement, a trinity or triangle of contradictories. That's the end of the footnote. Each part of the universe has become the whole, and phenomena and noumena are no longer opposed. But it is quite impossible to describe this state of mind. One can only specify some of the characteristics, and that in language which forms no image in mind. It is impossible for anyone who experiences it to bring back any adequate memory, nor can we conceive a state transcending this. There is, however, a very much higher state called shiva darshana of which it is only necessary to say that it is the destruction of the previous state its annihilation and to understand this blotting out one must not imagine nothingness the only name for it is negative but is positive the normal mind is a candle in a darkened room throw open the shutters and the sunlight makes the flame invisible that is a fair image of dhyana the footnote here the dictation was interrupted by very prolonged thought due to the uh, difficulty of making the image clear. Viracum. End of the footnote. But the mind refuses to find a simile for Atma Darshana. It seems merely ineffective to say that the rushing together of all the host of heaven would similarly blot out the sunlight. But if we do say so and wish to form a further image of Shiva Darshana, we must imagine ourselves as suddenly recognizing that this universal blaze is darkness, not a light extremely dim compared with some other light, but darkness itself. It is not the change from the minute to the vast, or even from the fine, uh, finite to the infinite. It is the recognition that the positive is merely the negative. The ultimate truth is perceived not only as false, but as the logical contradictory of truth. It is quite useless to elaborate this theme, which has baffled all other hith minds hitherto. We have tried to say as little as possible, rather than as much as possible. The footnote. Yet all this has come of our desire to be as modest as Yajna Valkya. End of the footnote. Still further from our present purpose would it be to criticize the innumerable discussions which have taken place as to whether this is the ultimate attainment or what it confers. It is enough if we say that even the first and most transitory dhyana repays a thousandfold the pains we may have taken to attain it, and there is this anchor for the beginner, that his work is cumulative every act directed towards attainment builds up, up a destiny which must some day come to fruition may all attain and that is the end of chapter seven and uh i will see y'all in the next video and we will continue to work through this book and uh once again i'll give a commission link for if anyone wants to buy a copy off amazon um it's really one of those really cool uh, magic books which is an honor to read with all of y'all and um, I will see y'all in the next video I hope everyone's having a great day everybody all right bye y'all see y'all in the next video